most of us will never see a lion or leopard or giraffe in their natural habitat, but many of us have seen them up close in a zoo. Sometimes that's in a big facility, such as the almost 300 hectares that's home to 5,000 animals here in the capital city, or it's in a roadside location with a smaller or specialty assortment of wildlife. Either way, ensuring that the animals are well cared for is a concern for all. With us now for more on that, from north of Miami, Florida, Dolph DeYoung, President and CEO of the Toronto Zoo. And here in our studio, Melissa Matlow, Campaign Director for World Animal Protection Canada, and Kendra Coulter, Professor in Management and Organizational Studies at Western University and author of Defending Animals, Finding Hope on the Front Lines of Animal Protection. Welcome to both of you in our studios and Dolph for joining us on the line. I should mention off the top that uh, TVO did contact many roadside zoos to take part in this conversation, but none were willing or able to appear on the program tonight. All right, with that, let's get a sense of what is happening out there when we talk about private zoos in Ontario. Melissa, I'm gonna to come to you first. Briefly, this is definition here. What exactly is the difference between, say, a roadside zoo and what many people might think, a petting zoo, a sanctuary, a safari, or even the Toronto Zoo, for example? Sure, I would call a roadside zoo a grossly substandard zoo facility that keeps wild animals in a standard of their own choosing. So you typically would see a ramshackle of different cages where animals are kept in you know, a small barren environment with little more than a food dish and a water dish and a shelter box to sleep in. Um, this could be someone's collection or hobby that they had and it just went wild. <laughs> um, and they're open to the public. These are private businesses. They're, they're, they're a business first and they're open to the public and they're allowed to open because there are very little regulations in place. Now, is it all of them when you describe with such descriptive language? No, there's there's definitely a spectrum of, of zoos out there with the Toronto Zoo uh, being, you know, one of our top zoos in Canada. Um, and, and uh, you know, there, there's, there's there's a variety of different places, but roadside zoos are typically those those hobbies that a hobby zoo that is on the side of a, a highway, which is why they're called roadside zoos in a rural town, um, with people who don't have expertise or any training in how to keep take, take care of these animals, versus a more established, professionally accredited zoo, which has training and staff and a business plan. And 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 our other guest Dolph will tell you more. All right. Well. Kendra, I'm hoping you give us a sense here. Do we know how many roadside zoos are in Ontario? Do we have a figure on that? I, I certainly know we have the most in the country. What's the specific number? I think it fluctuates a little bit, hmm. uh, depending, uh, you know, 50, something oh, well. like that, I would say. It's yeah. our estimate. All right, Kendra, one of the things I had mentioned, a few animals off the top. And uh, I think when people think of roadside zoos, one of the things we think about is big cats. And I'm curious, do we know how many big cats there are in the province right now? It's extremely hard to track. Organizations <laughs> like World Animal Protection have done their best to try to, to, to establish some, some firm numbers. It's probably higher even than we, we think. Uh, you know, these, it's, it, precisely as Melissa said, this is really unregulated. It could be talking about someone uh, having some in their, in their backyard or on their property. Uh, and then of course we get into the, into the private zoos. So getting a firm number uh, is, a is tough. What will ballpark wise? H Hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. Of, yeah. of, of big cats, uh, lions, tigers, uh, jaguars. Um, but again, as Kendra said, there's no public reporting of this, which is a, a serious problem for whether it's an emergency responder or a municipal bylaw enforcement officer, not knowing what they're gonna come across on someone's property. Oh. All right, I, I'm Kendra, I wanna ask you, you know, a lot of people might be surprised that there are lions, jaguars, tigers mm -hmm. in this province right now amongst us. I'm curious, what specific animals are banned in Ontario? Are there animals that are banned? It's interesting, in Ontario, it's actually only illegal to have two kinds of animals, pit bulls or orcas. So in contrast to a province like British Columbia, for example, which has pages of animals that have been deemed not appropriate for uh, people to keep or private businesses to keep mm -hmm. because we're not able to offer anywhere near the level of even basic uh, welfare standards for them. Uh, on Ontario is a bit of a wild west, pardon the pun, right. <laughs> uh, when it, it, it comes to, to which animals are allowed here. And, and most of it is left to municipalities. Uh, and uh, some research assistants and I actually dug into the numbers across all of Ontario's 444 mm. municipalities, and a full half of them 
didn't have any regulations governing the keeping of wild animals. Uh, so that's huge areas of the province. Uh, obviously an area where we could do with some provincial leadership. All right, we'll get into that. I want to bring Dolph into the conversation. Dolph, of course, you're at the helm of a publicly funded zoo, the Toronto Zoo. Uh, there's another component to what your organization does that I think the public may be not aware of. Talk to us a little bit about the Saving Species Sanctuary. What is it exactly? Yeah, this is an important addition that came through our master planning process uh, a year ago. And, you know, as we went out to the public, we talked about our mission of connecting people, animals and conservation science to fight extinction. One of the things they're looking uh, for good accredited zoos to do is be a home for those animals that could be in harm's way. And, and you know, kicking off the show with the number of uh, lions, tigers, when we get into uh, large reptiles, venomous snakes, it is really troubling that there's so many of these animals out there, we're not sure where they are, and we have such limited capacity to care for them uh, if they are abandoned or in a scenario where that passionate person passes away or who knows what. So uh, we added this to our master plan uh, in response to public feedback and to address the gap that, that really clearly exists here of not knowing what's out there and what happens to it if they end up in harm's way. All right, Kendra, I'm gonna to come to you. Recently, Melissa's organization, World Animal Protection, asked Ontarians to not visit private roadside zoos. I just wanna get your take. Do you agree on that strategy? Yes. If you want entertainment, you go see the film Blackberry. <laughs> if you wanna learn about animals, which I think a lot of people do, you read books, you watch documentaries. Perhaps you volunteer at your local humane society or for your local wildlife rehabilitator. Right? Roadside zoos, I think people frequent them for a range of different reasons. Um, sometimes I think there is that genuine curiosity and interest in animals that comes from a very laudable place, a good place. But sometimes I think m most of us would agree that it's just the novelty or um, you know, the, the, the entertainment factor. And the reality is that we need to move away from this idea of thinking of, of, of animals as objects to be, to be put on display. Uh, objects that we can be making money from, or, or the people who run these these organizations can be uh, can be making money from. All right, Melissa, let's talk Queens Park. What is Queens Park not doing about roadside zoos that you would like them to do? We would like to see them set up a comprehensive, proactive licensing system so that if you want to have a zoo, you need to have the professional expertise and qualifications in order to care for those animals, that you have a business plan, an emergency plan, uh, that you have the proper resources. Um, because right now, um, we have some standards, uh, but it's a Band-Aid. Uh, we're seeing charges being laid and then, you know, courts are being backlogged, so we don't even know if there's a success for a conviction. We've seen that with Marine Land a few times. Uh, and there's nothing to curb this problem. We have more roadside zoos than any other jurisdiction in Canada. So it's a massive animal welfare problem and public safety problem. So we need a proactive system of licensing. And, and really, if those zoos can't uh, keep their animals to a professional standard, they should be closed down in a pragma pragmatic way. Now, is this a little bit different than, we do have some standards, there's the Ontario Standard for Care, which is, mm -hmm. you know, food, shelter, water. Are we asking to double down on that, or is this something completely different? I think the standards that exist could be strengthened. Uh, we were at the advisory table um, providing input in those standards. That was back, uh, they were adopted, I think, in 2008, 2009. Um, so it wasn't everything we asked for, but it's something. Uh, but we've, it's also about enforcement. So we um, released a report last September reviewing 11 zoos in Ontario. All of those zoos um, had issues where there was potential uh, violations of existing standards. So even those minimum standards are being mm. violated. So uh, they need to be stronger, but it needs to be backed by uh, in strong enforcement, or else it's you know not worth the paper it's written on. All right, Dolph, um, Kendra had talked had used the language which has been used before, the Wild West, um, and let's talk a little bit about sort of this the sort of a, a patchwork job when we talk about how each municipality sort of has to come up with their own laws. How is that actually helping private zoos flourish? 
Well, I think what it's allowing them to do is is move to the spaces where uh, there's not regulations in place that let them operate uh, with their view probably minimal bureaucracy. But what that's doing is uh, leaving animals in substandard conditions and conditions where often organizations like ours get called in to assist where you have animals in uh, marginal habitats uh, without proper food, without proper care. And really, it's, it's an absolute tragedy. And the need to get clear on the fact that there's a minimum standard that both needs to be established and then needs to continue to evolve and improve when it comes to animals and human care to really make sure they're living lives uh, with purpose and not just because somebody thinks they're great, thinks they're interesting, thinks they're a curiosity. That's not good enough anymore. Dolph, there are a number of examples of sort of uh, roadside zoos that have sort of maybe taken advantage of, of the, the lax laws there. Do, do you have any examples that you can give us? I know there's one, if you think of just off of 62, just north of Bancroft as one example, where you know that has happened and the animals have actually ended up with you guys. Yes, and you know we're we're really pleased to have uh, the capacity, the quarantine facilities, the professional staff uh, to be able to help in those scenarios. Um, but really, what this is about for us is reducing um, that happening at all, uh, raising the standards so no animals are falling through the cracks. Uh, we were up outside of Maynooth um, in the past few years, and you had multiple animals in uh, containment that really was nowhere near the level it needed to be. Um, animals in, with very little enrichment, very little space in a, in a highly uh, competitive and potentially adversarial environment. What type and of animals? Sorry, we, no. Pardon me? What type of animals? Uh, lions and tigers in that case. Hmm. So I think when most people hear, uh, wait a second, that's in my backyard. You know, everybody on this call seems like a nice person. There is no world where they should be allowed to own a lion, a tiger, a primate, a venomous reptile, uh, a large uh, growing reptile. Uh, we really need to put a bow on this and make sure uh, we're removing that from the narrative because uh, it's not okay. All right, Kendra, as far as solutions go, should private zoos in Ontario be obsolete, shut down. Yes, I think we need to move in that direction while simultaneously having an action plan for the animals who are trapped in those conditions. Uh, there are examples from around the world. A number of these zoos have, have gone bankrupt uh, in, in, in different jurisdictions. Uh, I know of an example, for example, in, in California, where something like 28 tigers were moved to a proper animal sanctuary. Right. So we can have facilities where, where people uh, can learn about animals in, in a very authentic uh, and genuine way. Um, and so we want to be thinking about is that where these kinds of animals uh, should end up? Or perhaps they simply deserve peaceful retirement completely away from public view, given the lives that they've had, right? And so if people are wanting, you know, this is it's spring, uh, it's summer is coming, families are thinking about ways that they want to be, uh, to, to getting out and, and, and enjoying our province and, and, and entertaining their, their family members. And I think for many families that comes from a good place. I think a lot of people, as, you know, I see it with my students as well. In the past, we thought aquariums, we thought zoos were appropriate. We thought you could just pull over on the side of the road and it's mm. okay that there are tigers in cages, that this is normal. A society is shifting. Our ethical understanding of animals is shifting. Our, our, our understanding of animals' minds, social lives and needs are really shifting. Um, and so people are asking these really crucial questions. And, and that said, the desire to want to be around animals is, is, is a very powerful and authentic, and I think we want to nurture that. We want to care for animals. And so there are sanctuaries, for example, where the animal's needs are placed first, and that's, that's the key defining feature. Mm -hmm. People can still interact. The Donkey Sanctuary south of Guelph, for right. example, mm -hmm. is an opportunity where the public can visit a few days a month uh, while the donkey's needs are still held in, in high regard. The Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre is a wonderful facility where people can book educational tours. And we, of course, have an absolute majesty of wildlife, right? right? We want to think about how can we coexist with our own neighbours, whether they're you know skunks, raccoons, squirrels, while simultaneously getting out and enjoying the province and taking advantage respect Fully of the wild animals we ha we have around us, with whom we share this province, we don't need to be importing or breeding wild animals who belong in the wild and really often belong in other countries. All right, so see them in their natural habitat. Absolutely. All right, so I do want to read a a quote. You know, for their part, roadside zoos that would like to comply to an industry standard 
if there was a good one, they would like to do that. So this is actually a quote from a CTV W5 report from November 2022. It reads, what separates most roadside zoos from their better known cousins, like the Toronto Zoo, is accreditation. Adherence to industry standards set by Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums, also known as CASA. But some roadside zoo owners, like Alicia Patton at Greenview Aviaries, do want to meet accreditation standards. That zoo was one of the 11 named in World Animal Protection's recent complaint to the Ontario government. A lot of things do need to be changed. It needs to be more structured for everybody's safety, Patton said, referring to conditions at her recently purchased zoo. Melissa, I'm gonna to come to you. Of course, your organization sure. was mentioned there. Uh, what should be done to, I'll, I'll get you to comment on that too, but what should be done to help roadside zookeepers keep their business? Well, um, one, uh, I think, you know, we shouldn't be jeopardizing animal welfare and public safety for an economic opportunity. And so I think there could be support for these zoos to, uh, I think they should be encouraged to, to stop breeding and house their animals to a higher standard. That might be one pragmatic way to phase the, down the problem. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, Kendra mentioned it too, like the people, why are people attracted to going to these places in the first place? I mean, I've been to a number of these zoos, sometimes spend half the day and observe people's habits. And I mean, kids are spending very little time in front of that cage. They're often just as excited, perhaps more excited about the ice cream stand and the splash pad. So there are opportunities that don't need to involve, uh, animals. Um, some of these places are outside of our provincial park system where they could go and see animals in the wild. Perhaps these zoos could benefit from that opportunity and provide something else like a high ropes course or a corn maze or <laughs> you know something. Because often it's families that just want something to do. Um, if it's an education thing that they're, uh, they're, they're after, I know, you know people want to foster that sense of responsibility and concern for animals and endangered species. But I question the education you get when you see an animal in an unnatural environment where it can't even behave naturally. What is a child learning about that? I think what the children are learning, what adults are learning, is what do animals in suffering look like? Yeah. And, and we don't need to have the animals suffering uh, for, for that to happen, right? And often people are misunderstanding what they're seeing. Yeah. So often they're, they're, they're sort of imposing these human-held ideas yeah. on animals that they're observing, right? I think there's an opportunity for us to build a comprehensive set of organizations around the province, for us to, to, to have even businesses where animals are involved, but in a more respectful way. We could have indigenous-led tourism, for example, eco-trusts. There are opportunities for us to, 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 to show reverence for the natural world without needing to keep animals in cages or picture them simply as props for social media. All right, I'm gonna play devil's advocate, Dolph. Obviously, the Toronto Zoo. It, maybe, is there a case here that maybe something like the zoo doesn't exist because a lot of these animals aren't? Indigenous to to Canada. Yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, where we're at right now, captivity, because um, the idea of captivity until and, and captivity by whom. Uh, they're they're really important discussions to have, and, and the root of it actually is that people aren't paying attention. You know, I, I absolutely hear you that we want people to better connect with nature, but all the data we have suggests that wildlife and wild populations. You look at the WWF uh, Living Planet report. All those things are trending the wrong way. Uh, biodiversity loss, climate change. Uh, we need to be taking not a passive, but incredibly active role if we're going to suggest that education is of value and we're actually delivering on it, actually measuring it as well. And, and we've gone through a study with our partners at the Toronto Zoo Wildlife Conservancy that actually found when it came to palm oil and electronics recycling, uh, two visits, we were seeing an increase um, tendency for people to engage in those behaviors. There were four other behaviors we were looking for that actually our approach wasn't working. Uh, so actually digging into this to make sure it's effective and you're having the impact you're looking for to get to those bigger outcomes. Because you know we're dreaming of a world where we deliver on those 30 by 30 goals. There's a space for wildlife to live. Um, but when I look at the environment out there, I get very concerned that the only place we're gonna see animals is in managed settings if we don't actually get our finger on uh, what's going on in, in, in nature. The other thing I wanted to comment, because I think it's really important and I want to build on, on, on what our other panelists have said, a key tenant for us for animal welfare and well-being is choice and control. 
And uh, we often will get complaints. People are like, oh, I didn't see this or that at the zoo. Uh, Cause those animals are offered uh, front of house, back of house options, um, areas where they prefer the climate, areas where they can get away from the public. And that's one of the things they should have in most of their habitats is the ability to escape that viewing, escape that scrutiny. And uh, one of the things that accreditation standards drive towards is those uh, key values for the animal that gets away from that that passive object that somebody sees and points and counts like it's a checklist. Uh, it has to go far further than that. And the profession needs to continue to evolve to do better because uh, for too long, it's it's been a, a copycat profession locked in the past. All right, Kendra, obviously Ontario is lagging uh, in terms of many departments when we talk about roadside attractions. Is there a jurisdiction in Canada that we should be looking at and following some sort of model? Well, BC has set an ambitious legislative agenda, um, but we might actually need to look globally. And, <laughs> and I'm going to answer that in, in two ways. Yes. And in, in part, it's it, out of Belgium in particular, uh, there are what we call the positive lists that have been developed, which is the idea that animal species should not be in human hands unless we can meet a high uh, set of standards. Um, and so you begin with none and then start building which, which animals can be, uh, can be coexist with humans or can be kept by humans in ways that meet their physical, psychological, uh, and social needs. Um, so there are real opportunities for us to shift our, our paradigm. And simultaneously, when we're talking about many of the wild animals who are in, uh, in zoos today, these are extraordinary animals from other countries. And this model doesn't seem to be working, you know, precisely uh, as Dolph has said, that, that we're, we're seeing conservation in many parts of the world uh, uh, decline or endangered species numbers increase. It's, it's, it's very dire. In the places where it's successful, it's community-led. And it's, it's, it's conservation leaders in those countries, they're teenagers, they're young people, sometimes they're seniors, it's multi-generational where they're developing economic alternatives to support, because these, these animals often coexist with people in some of the poorest countries in the world uh, and poorest communities in the world, where it's seen as about science, yes, but simultaneously about job growth, about creating humane opportunities for people to, and communities to thrive. And so for us, in a wealthy province like Ontario, in a wealthy country like Canada, perhaps instead of giving our money to a private zoo, we should be supporting with donations the folks on the front lines of conservation around the world uh, and so that we can together be securing the future of wild animals where they belong in the wild. All right, Melissa, we talked and, and about... Can, yep. can I so, comment on this? Yep. I just, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly and one of our key uh, approaches with our capital programs now is when we're investing on uh, physical infrastructure here, we're also investing uh, across the world and really looking at getting away from that uh, colonial conservation mindset we saw in the past and investing in frontline workers in these countries. So whether it's an individual monitoring lemurs in Madagascar or working in a park, uh, protecting orangutans in Sumatra, making long-term multi-year commitments. And again, our Wildlife Conservancy has been huge with that uh, to be able to make 10-year commitments so we have continuity, so people can look after their families and deliver on protecting these animals for future generations. And it's a big, uh, nasty ball we're trying to unpack and untangle. But for the price of a plane ticket, in some cases, you can employ somebody for a year. So being far more um, pragmatic and, and quite frankly, aggressive in our approach to say, we're going to remove some of those safeties, make sure that money is flowing to frontline places where those species are at risk, and using uh, the zoo as a mechanism to do that, I think is a key part of the model we'd like to see adopted everywhere. All right, we're going to come back to Ontario now. Melissa, we've talked about the well-being and safety, of course, of animals. To what extent are children, the public, even zookeepers, and I'll even add bylaw officers who sometimes have to respond to this, at risk when it comes to our patchwork of regulations? It's a massive risk. Um, I mean, where do I start? There, there, have, been, there have been people who have been killed uh, because of an animal in a private collection. Um, Zookeepers, you're talking about. Uh, well. Zoo owner, uh, zookeeper, would you call him? A, I don't know, a private tiger collector. Mm. Um, a, a, and and that, that is a, an example that dates back to 2010. This was actually the, the spokesperson for the Roadside Zoo Association that was mauled by his own tiger. Mm. Uh, the municipality passed a bylaw to restrict him, and he fought it and won. And so he was a victim of his own success. And this is why we need the province to upload this problem. Away, yeah. He, yeah, he, he, he 
passed away, and uh, I mean, there have been kids who have been scratched. There have been these mobile zoos are a big concern as well. They're coming into to daycares and schools and senior homes. The people who are most vulnerable to disease risks. Um, you know, there was one story of a tarantula and a, a microscopic barb uh, got into a kid's eye. When that kid was brought into the hospital, the doctors didn't know what it was. Of course they wouldn't know what it was, right? Like these are, there's so many different species that are allowed to be kept. It, it's not reasonable to expect our doctors, our emergency workers, our bylaw enforcement officers to know not only the, about the welfare needs of those animals, but also the safety risks they pose to them and, and the community. All right, Kendra, it seemed early pandemic. It was sort of mandatory viewing uh, to watch Tiger King. Uh, obviously a series for people who don't know about big, a big cat owner in the, in the US. That is big business in the, in the US. To what extent is it like here in, in Ontario? Yeah, and I, we would we can call it legalized animal cruelty. Mm -hmm. I think um, you know everything that, that that folks saw in that show is is widely the norm. This is you know this is an absolute patchwork. Any kind of animal captivity exists across the spectrum. You have higher standards, and then you have absolutely uh, you know no regard that where the bottom line is being placed at, at the top priority. Uh, and 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 you know this this lousy meat, dang dangerous for people. Um, you know it, it was sort of a sensational experience, but the reality is is absolutely miserable for animals in, on, on the ground. All right, Dolph, I want to come to you. You know, many Ontarians don't live near your zoo. Um, and if we can properly regulate roadside zoos, why should the public not have the opportunity to see wild animals in their own municipality instead of traveling to Toronto? You know what, this isn't about those individuals uh, as far as the people, it's about the animals. And uh, we have to keep them front and center in this. And and it's an incredible privilege to get to be close to these animals, to get to work with them, and a huge responsibility, a sacred duty to care for them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I do apologize to them and, and we uh, do look to reach out to them with digital channels and other pieces. Um, but I don't think we're aspiring for a world where you have this patchwork quilt of animals scattered across uh, the province in substandard conditions. What we're looking for um, is a broader uh, understanding of what good looks like, uh, what progressive care looks like, and whether it's a positive list or a negative list, getting really clear on what it means to have animal species A or B uh, near you. And you know our, our standards with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, I think are just a key benchmark, a starting point to set that in place. And if you can't meet that standard, we need to ask the next questions of whether or not you should have that animal in your care at all. Melissa, um, as, as Dolph had mentioned, as, as we've sort of all, I've gotten from all three, is animals come first. I do need to ask, what is it about these creatures that captivate us? <laughs> Oh wow, where do you start? I mean, they're amazing. And and what we've what we've seen in our research is that it's often self-described animal lovers that are attracted to doing some of these harmful things, like the people who want to swim with a captive dolphin or ride an elephant or hold an animal for a, a photo op. They just don't understand how their desire to get up close to that animal is causing that animal that harm. So this is a big education opportunity. And it's miseducation when we allow this because, I mean, it's the exact opposite of what our conservation officers are teaching people when they approach an animal in the wild, right? It's mm -hmm. to to keep your distance, to not interfere, to not feed them. So if we really want to solve the biodiversity crisis and instill that respect for animals, we need to put a curb on our desire to get close because we're excited by them and give them respect. The best place to see a wild animal is in the wild from a respectful distance. Well, I mean, that you ask most kids about dinosaurs and they can talk to you for an hour or more and they've never seen a dinosaur live. Right? We want to be challenging that idea. Precisely as you say, it's coming from a place of love and care. Yep. Let's, as, uh, in, our, in our own relationships, in our communities, on opportunities like this, talk about what does it really mean to care for animals. And sometimes that means precisely us, us stepping back, uh, us allowing them to, to, and to, to have live the lives that they need, need to be living in the wild. All right, we are going to leave it there. Right. Thank you so much, Kendra, Melissa, and Dolph. Really appreciate it. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.